So we're going to talk about photosynthesis today. We're going to break this up into two parts as well. In this first half, I'm just going to try and introduce the overall process, its formula, the energy conversions with it, and sort of where it takes place, and sort of uh, how the uh, first steps work. Um, so this would be the overall uh, summary formula. Just like respiration, this is not a um, chemical formula. Um, so this isn't a one-step process. Um, and uh, as we're going to see, carbon dioxide and water do not directly interact, just like we saw sort of with oxygen and glucose in respiration. Um, these are just the overall ins and the overall outs. Um, so what do um, autotrophs or producers need to do photosynthesis? Um, they need carbon dioxide. They need water, and they need sunlight. Um, they need some kind of light energy, I should say. Um, we can also um, uh, help plants grow in sort of artificial lit greenhouses as well. Um, and with those three simple ingredients, they can make oxygen, although that's a byproduct. Um, and they can also make um, glucose, um, which is what they're trying to make. That's the goal of photosynthesis, is to make the sugar um, kind of stable chemical energy that they could use perhaps um, in many ways, as we will eventually see. Um, so this would be the chemical formula down here. Um, we can balance it um, if we just remember sort of what goes on each side. Um, it is basically just the reverse. Um, the products are the reactants of photosynthesis. The reactants of respiration are the products of photosynthesis. Um, so if you just remember what you do as a human, you can kind of flip it around and get photosynthesis equation. Um, and then you just need to balance it. There are six CO2s to match the six carbons in glucose. There are six waters to match the 12 H's that are in glucose. And then you just need to balance the oxygens, 12 from CO2 and 6 from H2O. Uh, and we got 12 from oxygen and 6 from glucose. So that would be the balanced chemical formula. Um, your book also shows you this um, that's worth talking about briefly. Um, sometimes that you can depict photosynthesis as using 12 waters and producing the same products, um, but also producing 6 waters. And that's fine. Modeling it this way is nice because what it's trying to show you is that um, it actually consumes 12 waters early on and then six are actually produced later when the sugar is being synthesized. Remember that synthesizing things often produces water. Um, but you, can, um, are, you are certainly fine with just focusing on the net equation above it where just six waters overall net are used to do photosynthesis. Um, I really like this figure as a way of introducing the process, and your textbook has a very similar figure that you ought to study carefully before getting too uh, bogged down by the details. Um, so this, this reaction shows sunlight coming in, um, and there are two basic steps in photosynthesis. There are the light reactions, and there's the Calvin cycle. So sunlight comes in, and in the first step, the broad goal is to convert this light energy into forms of chemical energy, um, which include ATP energy and um, high energy electron energy. Um, we've seen electron carriers in respiration before. There are the same electron carriers um, with one slight difference. We call it NADPH or NADP plus if it's not currently carrying electrons. Um, and I just think of the P as being for photosynthesis. Um, otherwise, I'm not going to emphasize the differences very much. So the first step, to take light energy and convert it into two types of chemical energy. Um, notice that in this process, water is also consumed, and it's actually the water that turns into the oxygen byproduct. Um, H2O and O2 are pairs in photosynthesis, just as they are in um, respiration, if you recall. Um, and that leaves the Calvin cycle, where the CO2 comes in and helps to build the glucose sugar. Um, so they're also pairs, just as they are in respiration. Um, and um, we're building the sugar, which is very endergonic, so that's why we're spending the high-energy electrons. Whoops, should have drawn that over here. And we're spending the ATP as well um, to help make it happen. So that's kind of broadly what we're trying to do. 
um, in terms of thinking about um, energy conversions. We sort of talked about this, but let's just go one step further. Um, again, we're going to see that the light energy um, comes in and is converted into the energy of high energy electrons. We're going to see that pigments like chlorophyll are responsible for that, and that's what I'm going to cover next. Um, those high energy electrons can be used just as they were in respiration to pump H plus ions in one side of the membrane. And then those H plus ions will have the chance to diffuse back through ATP synthase to produce ATP energy. Um, the other way we can use high energy electrons is to have um, them captured directly by NADP plus and make NADPH. We need both of those forms of energy in the Calvin cycle to convert those forms of kind of short term chemical energy into a longer term, more stable form of chemical energy, um, that of a sugar. So where does um, photosynthesis take place? Um, I'm going to assume for the purposes of this discussion that it's taking place within a plant. Plants certainly are photosynthetic, um, but there are plenty of other organisms that are photosynthetic besides plants. Um, there are also things like algae. Algae is a photosynthetic protist, um, a eukaryote, but not a plant. Um, and there are also photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria are an example. So I'm going to assume a plant here. Um, here I have a plant leaf, um, typically where a lot of the photosynthes photosynthesis takes place. Um, if a plant has a green stem, it might also do photosynthesis in the stem. So let's imagine zooming in to that leaf area, and we might see something that looks like this. Um, recall from previous units that we called this overall region the mesophyll in here. Whoops. That would be the mesophyll right here. Um, and those are filled with photosynthetic cells. We also talked about uh, the role of the stomata. Um, for example, one stoma down here that lets in CO2. Um, we talked, uh, this figure doesn't show the xylem, um, but the xylem would bring up the water from the soil. Um, and that the cuticle preserves a lot of that water but lets in the light energy. So we've got the three things that those cells need to do photosynthesis. Um, and let's imagine zooming in next to one of those photosynthetic cells. It might look like this. Um, they're only showing you one chloroplast organelle. Um, typically, these photosynthetic specialist cells would have multiple chloroplasts. Um, but that's where the photosynthesis would take place. So let's zoom in to that chloroplast next. It might look something like this. Um, the chloroplast, just like the mitochondrion, has um, typically uh, multiple membranes, um, sort of an outer membrane, um, and then an inner membrane um, uh, that we're going to call the thylakoid membrane. Um, so that would be the membrane ringing these little discs here. Um, these discs could be called thylakoids individually. Um, remember that we also gave a name for the stack of them. Um, we'd call that a granum, and there are multiple grana, kind of plural, in case you see that term as well. And we're going to see that embedded within that inner thylakoid membrane are a lot of the proteins that power the light reactions step. We're also going to see that the second step, the Calvin cycle, takes place within the liquid around the thylakoids, but store, still in the chloroplast. And that little liquid has a name. We're just going to call it the stroma. Um, there are some other structures kind of floating around here that are worthy of brief discussion. This is actually the chloroplast DNA um, right here. Um, so remember that chloroplasts, just like mitochondria, have their own DNA. Um, and they also have their own ribosomes. So we sort of uh, theorize that they could have at one point been their own cells um, because they have all the basics, DNA, ribosomes, and membranes. All right, so let's imagine now, um, I'm going to focus on the light reactions here as our first step. So let's imagine zooming in on that thylakoid membrane. We might see something that looks like this. Remember that membranes have phospholipid bilayers with proteins embedded within them. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot more about this particular diagram um, in the second half of the video. Um, what I'd like to highlight are a certain type of protein called photosystems. Photosystems are embedded all over the place within the thylakoid membrane, but they come in pairs, and they kind of work together in pairs, um, thus the Roman numerals 1 and 2 here. And we're going to see that photosystems are giant proteins um, that contain 
the f uh, chlorophyll pigments inside of them. So I'm going to ask you to indulge me one more time. We're going to imagine zooming into those photosystem proteins. And maybe you'd see something that sort of looks like this. Um, I actually think this is kind of a poor figure. Um, so I'm just going to kind of draw in a big um, photosystem around this. Um, so I want you to imagine that the photosystem kind of surrounds the um, green circles here. The photosystem is a protein complex. Um, and maybe each one of these green circles then would be a pigment. Um, so chlorophyll is one type of pigment, although photosystems contain more than just chlorophyll. And there's actually more than one type of chlorophyll as well. Um, but the pigments are really important because the, because the pigments are the molecules that can absorb light energy and do something useful with them. Um, in this case, they're actually capable of absorbing the light energy and taking electrons within them and boosting them to higher energy levels. Um, so that's what this blue arrow is trying to depict here. As it turns out, other pigments might collect light energy and they all sort of deliver it to, as it turns out, a central chlorophyll, a central pigment um, that actually boosts the um, one of its electrons in energy level. Um, and it actually shows it leaving the chlorophyll because as it turns out, the photosystem is going to grab those electrons and send them to do useful work somewhere else. Um, so that's a really important role for pigments because remember, really, everything's made of electrons. Um, pigments aren't the only things made of electrons. Any piece of matter has electrons in it. But what makes pigments kind of special is they can absorb light energy and do something with it. Okay. What kind of light can they absorb? They can absorb visible light. So remember that, that in the overall electromagnetic spectrum, which is really this entire thing um, here, um, the only type of, of energy wave that the pigments can do anything with are the, are the visible um, part of the spectrum, which is actually just a tiny little piece of it. Um, and so that might kind of raise a question, why can they only work with visible light? Why can't they do anything with other types of waves? Um, and that's primarily because our atmosphere um, uh, blocks a lot of other high energy particles, um, like gamma rays, like x-rays. And that's a good thing. Those are actually um, so energetic they can damage our DNA, as it turns out. Um, so these higher energy waves are blocked. Um, lower energy waves might be able to get in, although I think some of these are blocked as well. Um, but they're too low in energy to really do anything useful with them. So there's this little band of visible light that's let in by our atmosphere. And it's useful enough to boost um, electrons to a higher energy level. Um, so that's what you would imagine um, producer autotrophs would evolve to be able to use. So um, the, here is a typical uh, graph showing different um, wavelengths of visible light on the x-axis and sort of how well the different pigments absorb them on the y-axis. And just a reminder, there are actually different types of chlorophylls. Um, here they're showing chlorophyll A and B. Your book also briefly shows um, a different type of pigment called carotenoids um, that exist within chloroplasts as well. Um, but for our purposes, it's just important to have different types of pigments because they absorb different wavelengths well. Um, for example, chlorophyll A looks like it absorbs red and purple pretty well, but chlorophyll B absorbs blue and orange pretty well. Um, notice that neither one of them absorbs green very well. Sometimes that kind of surprises students. They say, well, you know, leaves are green. Why don't they absorb green very well? Um, and that's simply due to the idea of remembering what it is for us to see green. Um, we're seeing green because instead of absorbing that color of light, those leaves are reflecting that color. Um, and so they're coming into our eyes, and we're detecting that green color because it's being reflected to us. So uh, they absorb many colors of light well, but not green, because they reflect it. So um, we've just tried to introduce a few basics of photosynthesis in this uh, introductory part one video. The formula, the energy conversions, and sort of um, where the molecules are that do the work. We're going to see that the very first step involves a molecule of um, 
pigment um, that can include things like chlorophyll that are embedded within a photosystem protein complex. Um, that complex is embedded within the thylakoid membrane within the chloroplast of a eukaryotic cell. Um, prokaryotes have this too, but just in their cell membrane. So we're going to talk about all of the compli complicated steps in part two.